Hello there, my name is Dale. I'll be reading you, to you today. I'm really excited because it's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to read to children. I have three sons, but they are all grown up now, so it's been many, many years since I've had a chance to uh, read to kids. So thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Um, and then the second reason I'm excited is because of the book that I chose to share with you today. And it's called The Oldest Student, How Mary Walker Learned to Read. It's a beautifully illustrated book. And actually, um, the, not the writer, but the woman who actually drew the pictures, the, the, the illustrator, um, Oge Mora, lives very near me. So that's another reason why it's kind of cool that I get to read this to you today. So here we go. The Oldest Student. Whenever young Mary Walker was tired, she would shield her eyes from the sun and watch the swallow-tailed kites dip and soar above the trees. That must be what it's like to be free, she thought. There she is looking at the birds. But Mary didn't watch for long. Even at only eight years old, she knew that the first rule of the Union Springs, Alabama plantation that she lived on was keep working. Keep working. She knew the second rule. Slaves should not be taught to read or write or do anything that might help them learn to do so. Mary didn't stop working. She didn't learn to read or write either, but at the end of each long day, picking cotton, toting water to Papa and the other slaves who chopped wood for the train tracks or helping Mama clean the big house, she would lie in her little bed next to the crumbling fireplace and think about those birds. When I'm free, I'll go wherever I want and rest when I want and I'll learn to read too. When she was 15, it happened. Mary and her mother, her brothers and sisters were free. The Emancipation uh, Proclamation said so. What it didn't say was how a family with nothing except for the tattered garments on their backs could find food, clothing, and a place to sleep. Mary's father had died and the family was on its own. Freedom Road, Freedom Road. Across fields and through woods, ex-slaves surged like waves crossing, crossing to shore. Now that they were free, every road was Freedom Road. Can you imagine how great that felt? Anyway. Many headed north, that's where we live, and west and every which way, searching for long lost family members and we're simply experiencing the wonder of being free for the first time. Others, like Mary, chose to stay in the South. An organization called the Freedmen's Bureau helped those who stayed behind to find shelter on abandoned Confederate land. Mary and her family settled in a one-room cabin, and for the next few years, she worked alongside her mama to help feed her siblings. Seven days a week, seven days a week, she churned butter, cleaned houses, and cared for other folks' children. She is working. The hours were long, and if Mary was thirsty or hungry or needed to use the outhouse, she had to wait until she got home. At week's end, she would offer Mama the one lonely quarter that she had earned. One day, Mary met a group of evangelists on the roadside. A woman with soft wrinkles in her kindly face placed a big, beautiful Bible in Mary's hand and told her, 
your civil rights are in these pages. Mary didn't know what civil rights were. She only knew that top to bottom, front to back, that the book was filled with words. I'm gonna learn to read those words, she vowed, but not today. There was work to be done today. And tomorrow too. When Mary got married, she and her husband worked as sharecroppers, renting someone else's house, using someone else's tools, and planting someone else's seeds to farm land that they would never own. After they harvested the crops, almost all of the money they earned went to pay for housing, tools, and seed costs. Here they are, sharecropping. Mary was 20 years old when her first son was born. She opened her Bible and marveled at all of the squiggles inside. There had been no time to learn to read. A friend wrote Mary's son's birth date on the Bible, August 26, 1869. Then Mary dipped a pen into an inkwell and made her own mark beside it. Not a letter, not a name, just a mark. It was the best that she could do. She is with her new baby and her Bible. One day, Mary's husband died. She married again, and a second son was born, then a third. Mary made marks for these sons too. Now she had three growing boys. More money, that's what we need, Mary thought. But the only other job available to black women were as maids or nannies or cooks. The hours were long with only half a day off on Saturdays and like sharecropping, they didn't pay much. Mary sighed, words would have to wait. For the next four decades, 40 years, Mary sharecropped and did odd jobs to help support her family. In 1917, Mary's family moved to the little city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was the year of Chattanooga's great flood. The story was in all of the newspapers, but Mary could only study the pictures to understand what happened. By now, Mary was 68 years old and she was too old to share crop, but she continued to work, cooking and cleaning and babysitting. She also fried fish, baked cakes, and sold sandwiches to raise money for her church. On Sundays, she would sit in the congregation as the preacher spoke. She would clutch her family Bible, the Bible that she still couldn't read. when Mary was well past 90. Wow. She and her husband sat in their creaky rockers while one another, while one or another of their sons read to them. That was good of them. After the two younger boys died, the eldest read. Then Mary's husband died. Several years later, her eldest son died. He was 94. Mary had outlived her entire family. She was 114 years old and alone. Can't read, she said. Can't write. I don't know anything. Mary stood at the window of her retirement home and gazed down at the world below. Words were everywhere, on billboards and buildings, on store windows and trucks. She sighed. All this time, she thought, and they still just look like squiggles. She is with her family. And here she is all alone looking at those squiggles. Mary had heard about a new reading class in her building. She pursed her lips. No more, we no more waiting, 
she decides. It's time to learn. Out of her apartment, into an elevator, and down the lobby she went. When the elevator doors sprang open, Mary saw people sitting under a sign with a picture of an open book. She could not read the words. A neighbor walked up to her. That's a reading class, Miss Mary. Can I help you over? Mary shook her head. Then she gripped her cane and lifted her chin and walked straight towards that sign. Here she is, getting to that reading class at 114. For the next year or more, Mary put everything she had into learning to read. It wasn't easy after all. She was the oldest student in class and probably in the entire country. Could someone her age learn to read? She didn't know, but by God, she was gonna try. She studied the alphabet until her eyes watered. She memorized the sounds each letter made and practiced writing her name so many times that her fingers begin to cramp. She learned to recognize sight words. I know you guys know what sight words are. And then challenged herself to make short sentences with them. She studied and studied until books and pages and letters and words swirled in her head as she slept. She is working hard. One fine day, Mary's hard work paid off. She could read. Word of her accomplishment had traveled and people everywhere celebrated with her. Chattanooga's mayor, newspaper journalists across the country, and a man from the U.S. Department of Education who said, Mrs. Mary Walker, I pronounce you the nation's oldest student. All shared her joy. Look at everybody celebrating Mary. I love it. Mary felt complete. She still missed her sons, but what, whenever she was lonely, she read from her Bible or looked out her window and read the words in the street below. From then on, Chattanooga's honored, Mary, Chattanooga's honored Mary's achievement with yearly birthday parties. In 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson sent well wishes on Mary's 118th birthday. And in 1969, President Richard Nixon did the same. At that point, Mary was now 121 years old. Mary received, oh, sorry. She could read all those words that were once squiggles. Mary received many gifts over the years, a radio, a sofa, her very first television, a new Bible, a key to the city, and perfume and champagne from Canadian Mounties. She also received something that brought back those long days in Alabama in the cotton fields, her first airplane ride. From the cockpit window, Mary gazed at the trees and the rooftops below. No different than a horse and buggy ride, she joked, but she knew it was. The airplane dipped and soared just like those swallow-tailed kites of long ago. Mary decided that flying was a whole lot like reading. They both made the body feel as free as a bird. She is on her first flight. Each year before her birthday celebration came to an end, someone would whisper, let's listen to Miss Mary. The shuffling and movement would fade away until not a sound was heard. Then Mary would stand, her old, old, old legs, clear her old throat and read from her Bible in a voice that was strong and clear. She is reading, standing on her legs clearing her throat. When she finished, she would gently close her book and say, you are never too old to learn. The end. 
So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I hope you enjoyed The Oldest Student as much as I enjoyed reading it to you. Um, and you're never too old to learn. And if you just work hard at it, you can be like Miss Mary Walker um, and experience the joy of written words. Anyway, thank you so much. Bye-bye.